Thirdly, we're going to talk about the manner. How do you get into a Bible study? Or you could say it like this. Let's put personal back into personal Bible studies. And our fourth lesson, let's not argue about the method. We want you to understand in this particular seminar, although we're going to suggest a method, we're not here to have a competition among methods. There's no competition among lighthouses. And then lastly, we're going to apply the model and we're going to give you some practical applications of the seminar. We're going to answer some difficult questions that you might hear during a Bible study. So let's get started. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the Bible says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We've been very motivated in training gospel preachers, but brethren, it's time to get motivated in training Christians and how to evangelize. Let's get motivated. Indeed, there needs to be motivation behind evangelism. The sacred scriptures say the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Proverbs 11 and 30. Evidently, there are some who are just not very wise because they're not involved in any soul-saving efforts whatsoever. In fact, the statistics bear witness to this. If you look at the Where the Saints Meet book, you'll notice just by casual glance or observation the following. In the year 2000, the membership numbers recorded the following, 1,265,142. Then in 2009, there were 1,224,404. Now let's look at 2015, 1,180,000. No matter how you crunch the numbers, we're heading in the wrong direction. But let's look at it from just a mere standpoint of how many congregations are in America. For example, again, in the year 2000, 13,155 congregations. In the year 2009, 12,629 congregations. But look at 2015, 12,300 congregations. Once again, no matter how you crunch the numbers or how we view the faithfulness of any of these congregations, the fact remains Dear friends, we're heading in the wrong direction. We're declining, and unless something is done, we're going to continue to see the numbers go in the wrong direction. This is why we need to get motivated. We need individuals in the pews, from elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, preachers, indeed every Christian, the young and the old alike, to understand that evangelism is something that you can do. I want to demonstrate this for you, and I want to relate to you some very important conversion accounts of real people, individuals that you could contact today and you could ask them to relay their story. In the late fall of 2011, a preacher, the Somerville Congregation near Memphis, Tennessee, gave us a phone call. And when he called the office and I picked it up, he made a special request. He said, Rob, would you be willing to go and make a visit for us? We have a sister in the congregation her mother's not a member of the Lord's church, neither is her father. She's been brought to Christ by her husband, and she really wants someone to study with her parents. Her name is Scarlett, and her parents' names are Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. Now, I didn't know Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. I didn't know Scarlett. In fact, I didn't know the preacher who had called me. All I knew is that someone was asking me as a preacher to be an evangelist, to go and meet somebody. And so I wrote down their information, I placed it on my desk, and there it laid. It laid there for too long. In fact, I'll be quite honest, it bothered me. Now, I did begin to pray about it, because in the letter to Colossians, Paul told the brethren that we should pray about doors of utterance being opened. We should be looking for opportunities for saving souls. I felt as an opportunity he had landed right here in my lap, but I didn't know what to do about it. How was I going to contact these complete strangers? I knew that Jackie and Sheila needed the gospel, was I just to go up to the door and knock on it and say, I'm Rob Whitaker and I preach for the local congregation and I'm here to study the Bible. I know this was probably going to be the least effective method. And so I waited and I prayed. It wasn't until the spring of the next year that a young man came home by the name of Jonathan Smith from the University of Tennessee. Jonathan was, he was full of life. He was ready to talk to me about his participation in the local congregation, coming back home. And as we were discussing about school and about how he could actively participate at the local church, he mentioned 
a friend of his by the name of Evan Birdwell. I immediately asked him a question. I says, Evan Birdwell related to Jackie and Sheila Birdwell? He said, oh, yes, that's their son. Evan is my close, one of my closest friends, and they're like second parents to me. I knew this was the opportunity that we'd been praying for. I said, Jonathan, would you take me to their house? Would you introduce me to them? I would sure like an opportunity to build a relationship. That's how we began. Jonathan took me over to their home, just a few miles away. He knocked on their door, and when the door opened, Jackie and Sheila Burble, with a big smile and with lots of hugs, greeted Jonathan. Of course, they knew very little about me. Perhaps they knew that I was one of the local preachers for the Churches of Christ, but they really had never met me in a formal way, but they still invited me into their home. They invited me because of Jonathan. So we sat down and they just told stories about he and Evan as they were growing up, and they asked him about school. Then all of a sudden, Sheila observed a little bit of a silence, and she looked at me, and she said, now, who did you say you were? And I said, my name is, again, Rob Whitaker, and I'm, I'm the local preacher for the Churches of Christ. And because I understood in my mind that her daughter had been brought to Christ, I knew she would have some questions. And so this is what I said to her. I said, Sheila, I bet you have a lot of questions for me. She's, she kind of smiled and she said, you know what? I've got a lot of questions. And then the questions begin to roll off of her tongue as fluidly as any subject could be given. She asked me questions about our worship, our organization, and salvation. She made several observations about various doctrines that perhaps her daughter had shared with you, with her, or maybe others that had spoken to her about the churches of Christ. Now, in past years, I would have been very eager to answer every question that she gave. But you see, I had a plan for evangelism. Evangelism is a strategic effort by members of the Lord's church. And so I had already deliberately said to myself, Preacher, you're not going to answer her questions this time. You're going to defer her questions. You're not going to get into a 2020 game of answering and asking because that yields so little fruit. Even though I would be tempted when she would ask a question about instrumental music and why we don't use instrumental music, or let me put it in the way she asked, why don't you have music in the church? Oh, I was so tempted to explain to her that we have music in the church. It's just vocal music. But I was not about to chase that proverbial rabbit. You see, when those rabbits are running around the, the yard, it's so difficult to hold on to one of them. And when you catch one, there goes another one. And so I just let the question go. Then you might say, well, how did you handle the question? Well, I would say something like this. It was a great question, Sheila. You are definitely a very sincere religious person. And I would just defer and wait for another question. I did everything within my power to avoid a direct answer. It's not because I didn't want her to know. It's because I knew she wasn't ready for the answer. She wasn't ready to receive the information for which she sought. After about 10 minutes of this question and answer session, when I was being very general and, and deferring every answer or question she gave, then it came to another point where she looked at her husband and she said, Jackie, why isn't he answering my questions? I knew this was my opportunity to go into our second part of getting into a Bible study. You see, it's here that we began to talk about the showing method. I said, you know, Sheila, I'm not a very good teller, but I sure would like to show you. She understood what I was saying. You see, I wanted to open a Bible. I wanted her to read the scripture. She looked at Jackie and she said, Jackie, I think he wants to have a Bible study. And so I just smiled as they discussed among themselves the possibility of having a Bible study with a gospel preacher. I realized that that alone sometimes could be a little bit intimidating. But yet Jackie and Sheila discussed it and finally they came to a conclusion. Yes, we'll study with you, but it needs to be a private study. We don't want anyone else really knowing about the study. They were concerned about what their religious group might think. You see, they were strong members of the mi local Missionary Baptist Church. In this, in this Missionary Baptist Church, they were not only strong, but they were active participants. Jackie was the treasurer. He was a Bible school teacher. He was not only active and strong, but he was a pillar in the community. Everyone knew Jackie and Sheila Birdwell, and they didn't want outside pressure. They didn't want anybody maybe uh, uh, antagonizing them for going into the scriptures. They just wanted to keep it private. I was more than willing to accommodate, but I had one condition myself. I'm a firm believer in the power of prayer, and it's often the practice where I preach that we pray for those to whom we study. 
Sometimes they're mentioned by name in the pulpit. Sometimes just an uh, obscure email. We asked the congregation, would you pray for this particular couple? We're studying with them, and we want to pray on their behalf. But in this particular case, I knew it needed to be kept private. And so I asked her, is it okay for us to talk to the eldership? Can I refer your name to them so that we can be praying about this study? I'll never forget her question and the answer. She asked me, who are your elders? And I began to name them. Men like Joe Lynn and Hugh Clark and Hugh Wayne Clark. I began to name some of the men who were serving, Alvin Allen, Terry Jones. When she heard these names, she looked at her husband and she said to me, these are good men. I trust them. I know these men. That spoke a lot to me about, you know, the qualifications of elders, that they're to have a good report from them that are without. And so we proceeded to the study. We were going to use back to the Bible. We were going to do it in three weeks, one study per week. Now, I realized that Sheila was going to have a lot of questions. So when we first sat down to do the study, it didn't take just a few seconds for that question to come. Rob, can you tell me what the Bible says about the end times? Now, I wasn't about to chase that rabbit once again. I wasn't going to, uh, to, to bite on that hook. I realized that if we started talking about the end times, we're never going to finish the Bible study. So once again, I deferred that. I said, Sheila, would you write that question down on a piece of paper? Because it's a good question and, and one that we need to answer. But I want you to focus on the study because most of the times, the questions that you and Jackie are going to have, you're going to answer them yourselves in the study. She said, well, that's acceptable. And she wrote down the question. Now, we did this for the entire length of the study. But I did notice the longer we studied, the less questions she had. They were learning a lot about the scriptures. Now, I want you to understand that I was doing some homework myself. I really wasn't schooled in all the doctrines of the Missionary Baptist Church. And so when we weren't studying, I was making phone calls, for example, to her daughter, Scarlett. I would tell Scarlett about the study. And, I, and in fact, the day before the last study, the third study, I wanted Scarlett to tell me, why did you become a Christian? What was it that motivated you to leave the Missionary Baptist Church and become just a, a member of the Lord's Church, a Christian? She was eager to tell me about it, and I was eager to learn. There were some statements that Scarlett made that I believe were some of the most profound statements I've ever heard in my life. I'd like to share these with you. One of the things that Scarlett told me is that when she decided to become a Christian, and she became a Christian, that the Missionary Baptist Church practiced something called excommunication. Now, I realize that's not a term that you read about in the Bible, but they practiced this sort of where they would remove you from their roster. And in so doing, they would come to the home. And Scarlett was ready. She had her Bible, and she was going to give Bible answers to questions. She had studied. She had prepared because she believed they would try to restore her to be a Baptist. But she just wanted to be a Christian. When they came into the home of Jackie and Sheila, they observed these particular men perform that excommunication. Did you realize that she told me this? that they didn't try one time to restore me. It was really just a formality to them. They really didn't ask me why I left. They didn't use any Bible passages. She said, here I was with my Bible, ready to defend the faith of Jesus Christ with all these men. They didn't even try to get me back. Then she said something else to me. She said her friends and her family tried diligently to get her to come back. In fact, at times it was, it was very discouraging and even antagonistic. Some of her friends, would, would, they would invite her to come back for a particular service. They would ask her, why did you leave Scarlet? You've been a missionary Baptist all of your life. Why would you go over the Church of Christ? Scarlet, during one of these occasions, said to one of her dear friends, she looked them in the eyes, and as sincerely as she could, she said this, do you really want to know why? Because if you know what I know, you'll do what I did. That just sent really shivers up and down my skin because I realized what she was saying. Dear friends, when you're honest and you read the truth of the word of God, you have no choice but to obey. Honest people, they're always going to obey the word of God. That's what Scarlett did. That really motivated me. Now, Scarlett explained to me a little bit more about the beliefs of the missionary Baptist. For example, she told me that they had a complete opposition to baptism for the remission of sins. They didn't believe that was necessary to be saved. I know my work was going to be cut out. 
there's something else that you really need to know before we go into this third study. You see, as we were approaching the house, Jackie and Sheila were having a private conversation, a conversation that I did not know until after they became Christians. They shared this conversation with me. Jackie looked over at Sheila and she said, she, he said, Sheila, do you know that preacher that's coming? Do you know what he's going to want to do? He's going to want us to become members of the church of Christ. He thinks we're going to join his church. Now, remember, we don't join churches and I don't have a church, but this is just how they framed it. He told Sheila, I'm not going to join. I'm not changing. I've been a comfortable Baptist all my life. It's been interesting to learn a little bit more about the church of Christ, but I'm satisfied in my religion. Well, Sheila looked at her husband and she said to him, well, she says, I'm satisfied too. I'm not going to change either. This is the context that leads into the final study. When we had the final study, Jonathan and I walked into their home knowing that there was going to be a lot of resistance to baptism. When I got to the point about this particular condition to salvation, I brought out a chart. The chart's actually in back to the Bible, but I expanded the chart. I lengthened it, and it took us about an hour to get through it. But I wanted to build the strongest case I could for the truth about baptism. And as we begin to look through the chart, knowing that Jackie and Sheila had not observed, had not obeyed this particular command to be baptized for the remission of their sins, knowing that they'd be resistant to us, I really took my time. Now, during this particular part of the study, Sheila paused. She says, preacher, I want to share with you my experience, my religious experience. And she began to describe to me how she had been saved. Once again, perhaps in previous years, I'd have been very tempted to dismiss or to debate, but I did neither. I listened to Sheila. I knew she was sincere. I could see the tears in her eyes and I allowed her to finish. And I said, Sheila, let's continue with the study. Now, this is an important point that we're going to elaborate on during this seminar. Friends, you need to let the Word of God do the work. You don't need to answer every question they throw at you. Now, as we continue in the Bible study, I built this particular chart. I call it in Christ. I just demonstrate all the things that are in Christ. Then I show how hearing and faith and repentance and confession move you unto Christ, but baptism moves you into Christ. I quoted passages like Galatians 3.27, For as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We looked at Romans 6, 3, and 4, that we are buried with him by baptism into Christ. Dear friends, when Jackie understood the power of those scriptures, he paused. In fact, he looked down, and it was at that very moment that I knew that Jackie, for the first time, saw the truth. And friends, he knew he was lost. I decided at that particular time I needed to close the study. I looked at Jackie and I said, Jackie, what are you going to do with this information? He looked at me and he said, preacher, he says, I know exactly what I need to do. We both know what he was saying and his wife knew what he was saying. She looked at her husband and she hit him in the shoulder and this is what she said, Jackie, you said we weren't going to do that. I didn't understand at the time why that was a little bit humorous, but now knowing what I know and the discussion they had before we got there, I know what she was saying. They had discussed that they weren't going to make any changes, and he was ready to repent and become a Christian. Sheila was also ready to repent and become a Christian. Both of them saw the truth in the Word of God. Sheila made a special request during that particular part. She said, is it okay if I'm baptized in running water? I believe the Bible teaches that. I wasn't about to debate that issue. I said, Sheila, if you want to be baptized in wa running water, we'll take it right behind the creek into the creek of the church building. You can be baptized anywhere you want to be. Thinking that they were ready, I said, well, let's go. But Jackie says, well, now wait, preacher. He said, I'm not ready just yet. That was very difficult because I know that in Bible studies, if the person delays, they're probably not going to do it. So again, I went back to the scriptures and I showed them scripture after scripture about the urgency of gospel obedience. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. But they would not heed any of these scriptures. And finally, I asked Jackie, Jackie, what are you waiting for? What's so important? And he told me something that really hit my heart. He said, Rob, you don't understand. I'm the treasurer of the Missionary Baptist Church. I'm their Bible class teacher. If I just run off and become a member of the Church of Christ... 
and they hear about it, they're going to accuse you of all sorts of things and me. I need to resign. There was a part of me that really respected that, although I knew there was an urgency to obey the gospel. Jackie wasn't going to do it until he resigned. And so I left that house that night, Jonathan and I, in much prayer. I notified the elders, I brethren, please pray for this family. I don't know how long this is going to take. And yes, I was concerned that Satan would work hard to keep them from gospel obedience. During the next several days, my family, my children, my wife, we visited with Jackie and Sheila several times. We would go to their garden, we'd pick strawberries, and sit on their porch, and we'd just discuss. I was waiting for Jackie to make the resignation. I really didn't know when he was going to do it. And so when they walked into the church building on Wednesday night, we were surprised. It's interesting to see the results and the reactions of church members. I remember Sister Jill Birdwell came to me and she said, Preacher, she said, is this the couple we've been praying for? I said, yes, it is, Jill. See, everybody knew Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. They grew up with them. Their children grew up with their children. This was indeed a very moving conversion. When the invitation song was sung, Jackie and Sheila arose and they were baptized into Jesus Christ. It's really a fascinating account of conversion because there are a lot of lessons that you can learn. Friends, why are we losing and declining in number? I believe it's the point that many Christians don't believe evangelism works. They've not seen it from their pulpits. They're not seeing their elderships practice it. The deacons aren't doing it. The Bible classes aren't doing it. Friends, I want you to understand that evangelism is real. It's real and people can be doing it today. Just shortly after their conversion, Jackie was studying the scriptures. I've displayed for you an image of Jackie Birdwell. He's leading us in a Wednesday evening invitation. It's a thrill for a Christian who's taught someone the gospel to watch them grow in Christ. But there's some... else I want you to know. This is Evan and Amy Birdwell. Now, she wasn't Amy Birdwell at the time. Her name was Amy Sadler. Evan was their son. He had already graduated from high school and he was working. There's something you need to know about Evan. During the Bible study of Jackie and Sheila, from time to time, he'd pause and he'd listen. He lived downstairs in their basement, but he'd come up and listen and he'd go back downstairs. Now, let's notice a few things about Evan. His sister, has left the Missionary Baptist Church. His mother and father have left the Missionary Baptist Church. So, of course, one of the first things I said to Sheila and Jackie is that we need to talk to Evan. But there was a problem. Evan wouldn't want to talk to us. Evan really wasn't interested. And so I began to seek to build a relationship with Evan. Now, I'm a private pilot. I really enjoy in, in spare time and recreational time just relaxing and, and using that time to fly. 
I knew that Evan perhaps would like to go with me. So one time I said, Evan, would you like to take a plane ride with me? Oh, he loved that. So we got in the plane and we, we just flew around. I tried very hard not to say too much about the Bible or church. I'm building a relationship after all. And so Evan, we landed in an alternate airport. We landed and came back. We even went out to eat together. But I just didn't see a window where Evan and I could have a Bible study. Now, Evan knew that I would love to study with him. He just wasn't ready yet. And so I talked to his mom and dad. Sheila was pushing him to have a Bible study. But she said, Rob, the more I talk about it, the, the further he runs. Jackie, I begged him to talk to him. But Jackie, I think knowing Evan's personality, knew that if he talked about him, he'd just go further away. And so the time just wasn't ready. It wasn't until about a year later that I received a phone call from Amy Sadler. Amy had been given a book by Evan's sister, Scarlett. The title of the book, Muscle and a Shovel. She had read the book and Amy had called me and we knew each other, not in a very personal way, but just by passing, just because we'd been so, spent so many hours in their home. She knew the relationship and she had visited a few times. She said, preacher, she says, I'm concerned about my salvation. I've read this book and I'm not sure that I'm saved. I said, Amy, I would love to sit down with you, my wife and I, and let's do a Bible study because she was very concerned about this. But she said, but, but preacher, I want, to I want you to study with Evan too. I want Evan to come. I said, no, Amy, I can't make Evan come. She says, I can't either, but I really want to do it together. I said, well, let's do it this way. You just make sure Evan knows we're in a Bible study and he just might show up. But don't, don't, don't make it him feel as though he has to come. She said, okay, we'll do that. And so it is the case as we began the Bible study with Amy, in walks Evan. But there are some lessons that I need you to, to observe with me. See, Scarlett's sister really wanted Evan to obey. Amy and Scarlett are good friends. So Scarlett wanted to be at the first study, which I have no objection to. So as we were studying, Scarlett was right there. Now, when Evan walked in, his mother had this huge smile on her face. And Scarlett had this huge smile on her face. And so the first thing Scarlett did was give Evan a Bible. When Evan received the Bible, he pushed the Bible away. Evan didn't want his sister giving him a Bible. And then we tried to give him a booklet. Evan pushed the booklet away. Evan didn't want the booklet. Evan didn't want a pen. Evan just wanted to listen. And so we just allowed Evan to listen. Now, Amy was very active in this particular part of the Bible study. We went through lesson one, and at the end of the lesson, I suggested to Scarlett that maybe it should be just us. Maybe we should just be the one studying. And she agreed. And so the next study, we went to our home. And I asked my daughter to make a dessert. And she made that dessert and served us. And we displayed as much hospitality as we could. And as they sat around the table and we built that relationship, we walked through lesson two. They were learning and asking questions. And as long as it was answered in the booklet, we answered it. If it wasn't, we told them to write it down and we'd answer it later. But in any way, they were learning we went to book three. When we got to book three, both Amy and Evan decided to repent of their sins and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, just like their, his mom and dad, it didn't happen that day. They had to make some changes in their life. They made those changes, and we're going to talk about those later. But they became Christians. Let me share with you what it looks like when you baptize someone into Christ. It's really a joyous occasion. I remember the day she was baptized, her life changed forever. And when he was baptized, his life changed forever. You see, the conversion of Jackie and Sheila Birdwell was changing our community. People in the congregation saw that evangelism works and they can be a part of it. And they were watching their family become Christians. Can I share with you a, a real short account about Ed Goolsby? When we moved into the parsonage next to the church, I immediately wanted to meet my neighbor. So I walked over to the neighbor and I said, hi, my name is Rob. I'm a new preacher. He looked at me and he said, I know who you are and I know where you live. And if I need you, I'll call for you. And he slammed the door. Ed, he did not want to talk to me about the gospel. Understand that not everyone's ready, but that didn't discourage me in any way, shape or form. And so we just continued living there in the parsonage. And not many days after we moved in, we put something up called the invisible fence. The invisible fence is there to keep the dog from running off. Where our dog really didn't understand the concept of the invisible fence, and I didn't take time to train her. 
I turned it up to maximum power. She saw a deer go off the back of the lawn, and she took off dart lightning. When she hit that point of no return, it went off full power, and she went over on all fours. She shook. She yelled because it was, it was shocking her. Now, it doesn't do it for too long, but enough to get her attention. But she didn't know what it meant. She ran across the street and hid under the house of Ed Goolsby. So I had to walk back over there. When I got back over to the house, Ed opened his door and he looked outside and he said, Preacher, have you shot your dog? I said, No, Ed, I haven't shot my dog. I'm just trying to retrieve her. And he helped me get my dog and I took her back home. Now, here's where it gets very interesting. Another one of the new converts at the congregation, his name was James York. James was a volunteer firefighter. Ed was a volunteer firefighter and we were going to do a door knocking campaign. I said, James, would you knock on Ed's door and invite him to come and be with us at the congregation? And so James went and he invited him. I got a phone call. My cell phone rang. I picked it up and said, yes, James, what is it? Rob, Ed Goolsby wants to study the Bible. I said, that's wonderful. He's ready right now. I said, bring him over to the church building. See, Ed had had a very serious illness. Ed had a lot of serious illnesses. And his perspective on life began to change. So we sat down in that library. In this particular case, I decided to use the one study method. It takes back to the Bible, combines it into one study, and we began to go through it. Ed was very receptive to everything the scripture says. At the end of that study, Ed was baptized into Christ. Let me tell you about Charles and Mary Hunt. This was another door knocking campaign. You see, people in the congregation were being trained in how to become an effective evangelist. So it wasn't all about the preacher, and it doesn't need to be all about the preacher. Anyone can do this. So we were handing out house to house, heart to heart, and I got another phone call. The phone call came from Betty McCarter and Melanie Allen, two sisters, and they were passing out some of the material. And they had come to the door of Charles and Mary Hunt and their son Barry, who lived with them at home. When Charles saw them coming, he said he thought they were from a particular religious persuasion and he was going to send them away. He didn't want to talk to them. But when he saw house to house, heart to heart, he invited them in. He said, I love that publication. He immediately knew they were members of the Church of Christ. He said, would y'all come on in? And they began just a casual conversation. During that conversation, they expressed an interest in the Church of Christ. Even though they were Baptists, they wanted to know more. So Melanie Allen and and Betty McCarter sat down with them and began a Bible study. They began going through the material in the booklets. They were there for several hours. I didn't even know this was happening. I was miles away with others passing out material and literature. And again, I received a phone call. And the phone call said this, Rob, we've met this couple. They want to know more about the church. I think they may want to be baptized. This was great news. I said, where do you want to meet? They said, let's go to the church building. So they drove up to the church building, and we drove up there too, and we sat down in the library, and we began to study. I opened up again the one method study because they'd already spent hours in study, and I knew that they were very interested in truth. I mean, they'd driven up to the church building. And so as we moved through the study, I could tell that Charles and Barry were very receptive. But something was wrong with Mary. Mary began to shake. And in fact, during one part of the study, she took her hands, grabbed the table, and pushed her chair away. She must have moved 10 feet. I looked at Charles, and I said, what's wrong? He says, I don't know. Charles walked over to his wife. His wife said to him this, Honey, they've lied to us for years. The truth is so simple to see. Why have we been lied to? Why have we been deceived? You see, she saw the truth. She didn't understand why there were those out there telling her that she didn't need to repent and be baptized. She did not understand that. She was ready to be a Christian. Charles was ready to be a Christian. Mary was ready to be a Christian. Conversions like this are happening all over this country, but we need you to get involved. Let me introduce Terry and Marlena Starks. Terry and I had a unique relationship. I was the head soccer coach. He was the assistant soccer coach. Prior to this relationship, we had never met. I really enjoyed being around Terry. He seemed to be a really good person. He liked to talk about moral issues and the state of our nation. But then there was Marlena. Marlena would oftentimes come to the soccer field and she would watch. She would visit with Nicole. 
We knew that Terry and Marlena knew each other, but we didn't know to what extent. But once again, as our relationship budded, and as we enjoyed talking about the Bible and even how it related to his position as working with young people, he taught health class. Sometimes we talk about sin and how the scriptures can help young people avoid the consequences of sin. One day as we were visiting together, all of us were there, things got very quiet. Terry looked at me and he said, there's something that we need to talk to you guys about. He said, Rob, most people don't know this, but Marlene and I are living together and we're ashamed. We know this is not what God wants. I said, Terry, I'm so, so glad you felt that you could come to me with this matter. Why don't we sit down and study from God's word about what we can do to be pleasing to him? They both agreed. So we came over to our house and we began the Bible study together. It wasn't a long study because they were so receptive to the scriptures. As long as it was in the Bible, they agreed. They agreed happily. They wanted to get their life right with God. Now, we were using, once again, back to the Bible. It's an organized Bible study approach. We used three lessons. We went through both lessons, the first two. Then we went to the third lesson. Now, in the third lesson, we realized that there were going to be changes that needed to be made. And we knew that repentance was going to be very important. And so when we, when we got to repentance and we talked about what they needed to do to be right with God, it really hit them hard. All they, they already knew living together wasn't right. Coming face to faith with the scriptures. And when you develop faith, it helps you make those changes. They were made, ready to make those changes. We had previously discussed with them what they would need to do. They would need to obey the gospel, but they would need to repent, meaning they couldn't cohabitate anymore. There would need to be a separation. And then they would need to get married. This is what they wanted to do. So that night, based upon their agreement that they would no longer live together, and in fact, that night that Marlena would stay in our house, Terry would go to his house, we agreed to baptize them into Christ. They became Christians. They brought forth fruits worthy of repentance. The very next day, we took them into the church building. In a private ceremony, the wedding was performed. And now they were Mr. and Mrs. Terry and Marlena Starks. Dear friends, the power of the gospel changes the lives of people. And when faith is developed, it helps make people make the transition to living a life that pleases God. I've got to tell you about this young man. I'm standing there with him. I know I look a lot younger because I was. His name is Mel Hutzler. Today, Mel's a gospel preacher. But at that time, he was just my closest friend. You see, he was my neighbor in the local community. At times, Mel and I spent a lot of time together. Sometimes we'd argue, as friends do. But we really, we really enjoyed just uh, spending time together in the country. We'd ride horses together. We went to school together. When we got our driver's license, we drove together. But there was something about Mel you need to know. Mel was not a member of the Lord's Church. Mel was a Catholic. Mel was a devout Catholic. His family were devout Catholics. In fact, I have never known a family more devout in Catholicism than the Mel Hutzler family. His father and mother and his four brothers and his sister, they all attended mass. Mel was an altar boy. He'd gone to their schools. But Mel, and Mel was very religious. But from time to time, we would discuss religion. I wanted Mel to go to heaven. And in my understanding of the word of God, you needed to be a Christian, not a Catholic to go to heaven. And so I'd open the Bible and we'd just read passages together. One of the passages we often read was this one, call no man your father upon the earth. Well, one is your father. And we're talking about God, of course, in a spiritual sense. And we would read that passage about what Jesus said. And, and I would ask Mel, Mel, why do you call your priest a father? I just wanted to know. Mel, he said he couldn't tell me. We spent a lot of time about the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. And he observed that the scriptures teach that baptism is an immersion. Baptism means we go down into the water. Mel, why do you practice sprinkling? Why don't you do what the Bible says? Now, these discussions and questions went back and forth for several years. Finally, Mel, as he became more convicted of the truth, he said to me one day, he said, Rob, he said, I really would like to become a member of the church. I'd like to become a Christian, but I don't think my father will let me do that. Would you come and study with my dad? Would you show my dad what you showed me? I said, Mel, I'd be glad to do that. Now, remember, I did not have perhaps the, the soft touch, maybe, 
maybe the techniques and, and the experience that I have today. And so perhaps I didn't approach all these subjects as I needed to, but I did open my Bible with his father and I showed him these passages. And I asked him questions, just like I talked to Mel, but his father was going to have absolutely none of it. In fact, his father became so upset about the discussion, he asked me to leave. He told me never to come back. He told me to stay away from his son. It was a discouraging moment in my life. When I went back home, I cried. I asked my mom and my dad, I said, what did I do wrong? Why, why did his father treat me like this? I just didn't realize why someone would not accept the truth. It's so plain in the scriptures. But there's something else that was happening back at Mel's house. You see, Mel continued to study with his dad. And Mel observed that his dad could not answer any of his questions. He could not find any passages in the Bible that would confirm Catholicism. And so Mel decided that he wanted to obey the gospel. And his dad told him, son, you, if you obey, you must leave this house. If you remain a Catholic, you can stay. Mel decided he wanted to be a Christian. And so he left that house that night with his bags packed. He came to our home. He knocked on the door. We opened the door and my parents greeted him like they would their own son. They told him that he always had a place in our house. And so Mel stayed there. Later on, he and his dad had a discussion. This is sort of the discussion, the tenor of it. Son, if you'll go talk to Armand Sr., I'll allow you to come back into our home. If you talk to him, I just want you to talk to him. Agree to do a study with the Catholic Monsignor. You can come home. But do this before you decide to become a Christian. Mel agreed to that. And so Mel and I were going to go talk to his Monsignor. But as events turned out, I was not able to go with him. And Mel had to go alone. And so Mel went to talk to the Catholic priest. Mel recounts this particular Bible study. Mel went in with an open Bible. The Catholic priest told him on multiple accounts, you don't need a Bible because we observe the Bible and tradition. In fact, at one time, the Catholic priest closed his Bible. Mel opened his Bible and began to quote the scripture. Then the Catholic priest took the Bible away from Mel and laid it on his table. Mel said when he saw the Catholic priest do that, he knew, he knew that it was wrong. And he knew that he needed to obey the truth. And then the next week, Mel came forward and he obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, isn't it motivating to watch Christians grow? This is a, a depiction of myself and Mel on a mission trip in Jamaica. Did you know today that Mel is a gospel preacher? He's a gospel preacher for the Lord's church. These are exciting things that we can recount together. I hope these things are motivating you today. Why are we not motivated in the Lord's church? When you see the power of the gospel demonstrated in real people's lives. Maybe it's Matthew 8 and 26. When the disciples were so afraid of the tempestuous storms, Jesus looked at them and said, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Perhaps it's a lack of faith today. There's the motive behind or the reason behind why we're not evangelizing like we should. Dear friends, there are so many prospects available out there. Do you know any prospects? Some